presence together. So welcome. Uh, some announcements before we continue on. Soup Kitchen, uh, which is December 2nd, so just under two weeks away on that Saturday from 11 in the morning to 7. The ladies on the committee, they'll have, if you signed up for things to bring and or shift to work, they will have that paper for you uh, in the social hall afterwards. Your reminder slips, okay? So make sure you get that. The other thing about Soup Kitchen on that last shift of the evening, I'm not sure if it's maybe 6.30 to 8.30 or somewhere in there, there are still some open spots. Uh, I'm not sure what they are, but that's out there. Also, we have the, is it fourth through eighth graders that help um, with clear tables and that? So there's openings for them too. If you haven't signed up for your youngsters, then take a look at that. Otherwise, a uh, big thanks to the committee for all the work that they're doing to make this happen, happen for the women of the church. We have coffee hour today after church in the social hall, so hopefully you'll stay and join us for that. Also, this Wednesday is Thanksgiving Eve service at 7 o'clock. I always say that if this is where you need to be, Right? Don't be sitting home watching TV on Wednesday night, okay? We have so much to give thanks for. As you see in the bulletin, the offering goes to the Moore Committee. We've done that for the last several years. Very important. This next Sunday, um, it's not Advent yet. We actually have a week in between this year. Usually we don't get that, but Christian Ed Committee will be putting up the Christmas tree and all that after church next Sunday. Christmas program lunches, so there are sign-up sheets out there for that, and last I looked, there's several spots of items needed. Three Sundays lunch after church, before practice, 
The fourth Sunday they practiced during church, dur- not during church, during Sunday school hour, and there's granola bars. I think there were sign-up spots for those. So please take a look at that. I know Vacation Bible School, that seems way out there, but the reason the dates are in there, if you take notice, is because we had that survey early on of do we want to keep it as we've done starting on Memorial Day or move it to the end of July, and the majority are to will keep it as is. So that's for you that plan way ahead on your calendars, like I have to put that on there. Those are your dates. Lastly, the parts were given to the children and youth for Christmas Eve program. I'm meaning the speaking parts, okay? During Sunday school today, they, your children should have got those uh, for kindergarten through eighth grade. So make sure they have it. The reason they're given out now is, guess why? So they can work on it before the first Sunday of program practice. That's why they're given out now. I have one other thing. This is a thank you note from Hannah Mettler. She was our Mission Fest speaker this year and did a wonderful job. She said, Dear Salem Reformed Church, because of you, I get to be a part of YWAM, Louisville, Louisville, can't quite say it like she did, Louisville Mission. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak at your church. It was a huge honor to get to make new friends and share stories of God's faithfulness through missions. Thank you for giving so generously. I am so thankful and blessed. Love, Hannah. So uh, she was overwhelmed with the offering, and so we're happy to be a part of that. The rest of the announcements, as usual, please read as you have time. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day. Every day is beautiful because it's the day that you've made. And we rejoice in you and your goodness. We're glad to be here. We've sung your praises already and will continue as we've stood and sang. We stand in awe of you, of your power and your majesty and your glory. And your beauty, Lord, you are too marvelous for words. How can words in our language even begin to describe you as who you are in all your goodness and majesty? But you've given us our language, and so we use our words to do so with our lips and our voices. Thank you, Father, for all that are gathered in here today and on this week of thanksgiving We do have so much to praise you for, Lord. You are our great Savior, our King, Jesus, the Lord of all. And so we praise you for that most of all. Let your glory fill this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll stand and sing. Looks like we've got to use our hymnals here. Number 17, we're thankful for the sound and projector people they work diligently and with technology we know how it goes and this is one of those days we have our hymnals let's stand number 17 our great savior
Okay, we will have our sharing of joys and concerns here. Uh, start out with, today is my wife's Medicare birthday. We'll say it that way. <laughs> she made it. <laughs> Yay. Blake Ramos is also today. I don't know where you're somewhere. There you are, Blake. Happy birthday to Blake. Probably number 19, I suppose. Yeah, got a ways to go to 65. <laughs> but it'll happen very fast, yes. Shoe boxes, so I don't, we probably don't have the picture because that's not working back there. So, But praise the Lord, we had a picture of all the shoe boxes for Samaritan's Purse. You see in the bulletin there were 62. Is that correct? 62? Okay. So... Um, also, a couple other things. Uh, Brian and Amber Cross, Amber's mom, Amy, passed last Sunday. I had announced that. Her funeral was yesterday down in Omaha. So prayers for them. Uh, it was a difficult time. That cancer went very, very fast. So just be lifting up the family. Also, Doug Stabner, maybe most of you have heard, Roberta's husband. He passed this last week in the care center. I forget which day, but his Funeral is tomorrow at Grace Lutheran at 10.30. The visitation is this evening from 5 to 7 with a prayer service at 7 also at Grace Lutheran Church. Which, on that note, just reminds me this evening is also the Olivet Church has their chili cook-off here at the gym starting at 5 o'clock. That's in the bulletin there. Um, and I was asked, may, maybe a lot of you knew this, uh, Daryl Johnson over from Freeman. He managed the hardware store, Ace Hardware, there, and he had passed. His funeral was yesterday as well. So just prayers for all of those families. Um, that's, guess what I had up, down on my list so far. Anybody else? Oh, it's good to have Tim Wendt with us here. Yeah, he was our Mission Fest two, speaker two years ago. So good to see you, Tim. All right, amen. Thanks for all you do. Any, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, she, okay, okay, good, good. Jeff's just expressing thanks to the congregation for the beautiful Mission Fest offering for Hannah, that's their granddaughter, and also the prayers for their daughter Jill, who when she got back had that heart issue going on, and that was a rough week there for a while, but she's doing better, getting stronger each day. Okay. Yes, Audrey, first of all. Isaiah's birthday was this last Thursday. How old is Isaiah? Eight. Eight. You tell him happy birthday, okay? Oh, he... Okay. All right. Sherry, did you have your hand? I did. Steve's birthday is on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. 
Hey. Yay. Steve Pressler's birthday is on Wednesday coming up. Also a Medicare birthday. Yeah. Amazing how that lowers the imp- insurance premium that you pay for us by $1,000 a month less. Isn't that crazy? Who had their hand right here? Somebody. Lori. Wow, Johnny's Medicare birthday is coming on Saturday. All right, happy birthday to him. Okay, how about over on this side here? Okay, got it. Okay, let's pray then. Heavenly Father, thank you for these birthdays, several of them, young and old alike, and everywhere in between. And we thank you for these individuals that bring joy to our lives in many, many ways. Bless them with continued health and strength, Father, we pray. Uh, Lord, we want to lift up these families who've lost loved ones recently, Brian and Amber Cross and Roberta Stabner and her family and also the family of Daryl Johnson. We lift them all to you and ask you to comfort them as you hold them close in your everlasting arms. Lord, we do pray for our care center here in Menno and the ones in surrounding communities that have been battling uh, COVID cases in there, which is never fun for the residents or the employees and staff, but just watch over them. We pray that you'd breathe by the wind of the Holy Spirit of God through these facilities and just clear that virus out of there in Jesus' name and give the staff strength and the residents as well through these times. And we know that you do, and we thank you for your healing touch upon them. Lord, for a couple unspoken cases, you know who they are, people who need your healing power, and I lift them before your throne also. We thank you for uh, Israel, as we pray for Israel, and that whole region there, and the situation going on, asking for your help, Lord. You know the times, you know the day of the return of Christ, Heavenly Father. And you know what all has to happen. And you are working, lining everything up. And we know that and we trust in you and we rest in you. We pray for the people of Ukraine, the same situation, things they're facing there. So thank you for our troops that have to be over there and other parts of the world, abroad, with their lives in danger, at home, working behind the scenes in ways that we are not even aware of. We thank you for all of them. Guard them and keep them safe. Lord, with that, I think of our first responders again. We're so thankful for in our local communities. All of these men and women are just volunteering their time. And even last night at our school, I guess there was a little... Uh, it's an incident of a fire, but thank you for all that came and got it taken care of. Lord, we pray for our own nation, for your power, your re- the power of your spirit bringing revival across this land. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, I want to read from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Amen. Great verses to think about. Let's stand as we sing the doxology, please. Father, we do praise you as we bring our offerings and our tithes here to this, your storehouse, 
We do with great joy and thanksgiving and by faith, Lord, knowing that you are faithful, that you help us as a local church to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just here within the walls of this building, but wherever we go, through our jobs that we share the love of Christ, that we model it and help us to be examples of your love as you shine through us, Jesus, the light of the world. So thank you for providing for all of our needs according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In your name we pray. And Father, we confess our faith together now through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If the children want to come, please, for the Kingdom Kids time. Thank you. Thanks. Oops. <clears throat> Here we go. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you all doing today? Well, I know that you get to go ahead and sit down. You get to get out early on school on Wednesday, and then you don't have school on Thursday or Friday. Why is that? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. We get off for Thanksgiving break. And Thanksgiving, what is that day about? Some of you older ones might know better. It's when we give thanks, right? We eat turkey. Yeah, mashed potatoes, corn, all of those things, right? Okay. Getting together with our family and friends, right? Giving thanks. All of these things. Your hand up. Saying thank you for Jesus. That's really cool. What? What? From the first Thanksgiving. Do you know when the first Thanksgiving was? That's a long time ago, back in the 1600s, when the pilgrims left England. They came all the way to America, and they met these Native Americans, and they helped them to grow food and uh, catch and kill animals, and they had a big celebration. And you know what? Their celebration lasted for how long do you think? What? Three days. That's right. Three whole days. Wouldn't that be cool to have Thanksgiving for three whole days? No? Yes? I don't know. <laughs> well, today, you know, I'm going to read the scripture. It's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, Paul's telling us, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He told us, to give thanks in all circumstances. Does that just mean that we should thank God when things are going really good and everything's wonderful in all circumstances? Well, some of the circumstances will be that way. But in all means that we thank God when things are good and when things are bad or not good. So we're going to play a little game here. I'm going to tell a little scenario, and you're going to answer some questions for me, okay? So just pretend we're all on the sports team, okay, and I'm your coach. 
And we just won a game. We just, wait, put your hand down. We just won a game. Are we excited? Yeah. yeah, so what can we thank God for? We just won a game. What can we thank God for? For winning the game. For good playing, right, yes. Cheering our team on, right. That's some things we can thank God for. But what if our team lost? What if our team lost? What can we thank God for? For no one getting hurt. hurt. Good. For us playing the best that we could play. For For us trying our best. All these things. You can be glad and happy for the other team because a lot of times they're your friends, right? Okay, good. Second example. What if it was a beautiful sunny day and it was just awesome weather, the wind hardly was anything, and we got to go outside? What could we thank God for? Somebody different. That's sunny out. Fresh air. Yes. All of these wonderful things that we could go outside and play. How about, though, if it rained all day, if it was really, really cold, and the wind blew terribly, and we could not go outside? What can we thank God for? Letting us stay inside and watch TV. Oh, letting us stay inside and watch TV. Not having to go outside and do all those things. Rain for the crops. Yes, we thank, thank God that we need those things, right? Okay, last example. What if someone was sick and we prayed that they would get better? And guess what? They did. They got better. What can we thank God for? For helping them to get better. That they're well, right? Valerie? For healing him. Yes, those are all wonderful things. But what happens if we prayed and they didn't get better? In fact, they end up dying. Can we still have something to thank God about? That they're in heaven now. And one day, what? Are we going to see them one day? We're going to see them one day. What else? Bo, do you have one? God is with them. Yes. We don't understand all the reasons why they didn't get healed, but we can thank God for the times that that we were with them and that we got to be with them, and they loved us, and we loved them. And you know what? It's hard. Those are hard things. But Paul tells us, give thanks in every circumstance, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And one of the best things to remember is we can do this because God is always with us. The Holy Spirit is always with us, and he will help us through any situation, especially the hard ones. Okay? Let's remember, are we going to be thankful this week? Are we going to be thankful this week? There we go. Let's be thankful. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we are going to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. And as all the boys and girls have said, we are thankful for so many things, and especially you, Lord. Uh, giving us Jesus and being with us forever and ever. And no matter what circumstance we have every single day, that we can be thankful that you are with us and you will help us through and help us to see the good things. I thank you for all these boys and girls. Help them to shine your light wherever they go this week, Lord, to tell someone that you love them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, and get your papers. Amen. Thank you, Anne. So we're going to sing that song, Give Thanks. Uh, It's actually in the praise book is number 21. It's usually where we sing it out of. It's in the hymnal on 170. So whichever you prefer to look at. But give thanks.
Father, we do, with all of our hearts, we give you thanks to you, the Holy One, Lord God Almighty, the Ancient of Days, because you've given your Son the best gift of all. We say thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We say thanks for your word, the very living word of God. Father, we say thanks because we have your word available to us so freely in in so many ways in this day in which we live. We say thanks for those people centuries ago who gave their lives so that we could have the word of God in the English language. We say thank you. And I ask, Father, that you would speak through me by your spirit to those gathered here this morning. Let our ears be opened and our minds focused upon you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're in Zechariah chapter 8, second to the last book in the Old Testament. It's Zechariah and then Malachi. Zechariah chapter 8. Last week we were in Revelation. We talked about the mark of the beast. So if you weren't here, it is online. Uh, I wanted to use last Sunday, today, probably next Sunday since it's not Advent yet, just to talk about some end time things and why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe, of course, because the Bible says so. So Zechariah chapter 8 I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. It, later, and the whole chapter, it just all flows, but uh, I'm just going to read the first eight verses. I'd encourage you to read the rest of the chapter later today. Again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and will dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with cane in hand because of his age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. And then we'll stop there. Again, it's an awesome chapter. Uh, Read it later today. And I'm not even going to make it through the eight verses this morning. But I will tell you this, as you read through that whole chapter, there are, if you count, mark them, Ten times 
in that one chapter, God says, this is what the Lord says, or this is what the Lord Almighty says. Because what he's prophesying here by the Spirit of God through the prophet Zechariah is so incredible to their ears, which I'll tell you why in a little bit, but it's so incredible that it's like they can't even believe this. That's why he's telling them ten times over, this is what God Almighty is saying to you. So let's talk about this today. Last week, as I said, we talked about the mark of the beast, how things are all in place today for that to happen. Whenever the rapture of the church church happens, church is taken out of the earth, the Antichrist will step up into power, and and things will be all in place for him to do what he's going to do. So, back up here. So, why do we stand with Israel? As strong as we do, why do we? Well, good question, and we're going to talk about some of those things. First, number one, because God's Word tells us to. Number one, and most importantly, we find it in His Word. All the way back to Genesis chapter 12, God is speaking to Abram before He changed His name to Abraham. So, we're going back 4,000 years ago, approximately, from today, and God calls Abram, Abram. He says, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you, which was going to be Israel. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Here it is. I will bless those. So Abraham is the father of the Jewish people, all right? I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth, that's us today. How are we blessed through Abraham? Because that's the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, right? So that, those words weren't just for Abraham at that time, 4,000 years ago. Those words hold true all the way through the last 4,000 years up to today. How about Deuteronomy chapter 7? And this is in the meditation part of your bulletin. This now, we come up to Moses. <clears throat> and he's speaking words of God to the people of Israel. They're in the desert waiting to go into the promised land. He's reminding them. Moses is reminding the people of what God has said. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. Important word right there. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other people, the other nations, for you were the fewest of the peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers, going back to Abraham, that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, out of Egypt, right? From the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant, important word right there, of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. That's us. You know how many years a thousand thousand generations is approximately? 40,000 years. Because they figure a generation to be 40 years. That's where I'm getting at. To a thousand generations, God says, I keep my covenant with the people who love me. So there's just two verses of Scripture, why we support Israel, why we stand with them. Again, I said this last Sunday, but just to be clear, I'm not saying that just because someone is born into the Jewish race by flesh and blood that they're automatically into heaven when they die. No, they, 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 
the Jewish people, a lot of them tried to say that to Jesus when he was on the planet. We have Abraham as our father. Well, who are you talking to? Man, we're, we're in. No, Jesus didn't accept that. The only way to be in is through Jesus Christ. doesn't matter what race you come from. But God still is working and will do through the Jewish people and the land of Israel. We'll see that as we go on. Why? Why, secondly, because we have been incredibly blessed by Israel. You think about it. Actually, Jesus in John chapter 4, verse 22, when he was dealing and ministering with that Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, in that conversation, and he makes this phrase to her, and he said, salvation comes through the Jews. And it does, again, because that's Jesus Christ. Okay, he said it clearly. We owe an incredible debt to them. That It is because of the Jewish people that we have the Holy Scriptures. Of course, through God Almighty, but working through the prophets, Jewish men, to write the Scriptures that we have today and preserve them so incredibly. Our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, as I've said probably now the third time this morning, is a Jewish Savior by race. So, we support them, we pray for them. The sad part is uh, much of the Jewish population uh, are either, a lot of them are atheists, which is hard to believe. And many of them don't believe that Jesus is their Messiah. Ones that have come to know Jesus as their Messiah, we call them Messianic Jews, right? That's what we call them. Ann and I, just last Thursday night before we went to bed, we were watching TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, and this uh, Joel Rosenberg was on. Maybe you've heard of him. Does a lot of work there in Israel. And he was interviewing this, the parents of, of one of the first Jewish soldiers who went in just after this happened on October 17th. He was on the front lines of the Jewish soldiers going in to the Gaza Strip, and he was one of the very first ones to be killed in that process, 19 years old in the Israeli army. And I mean, very tragic. Of course, all of the deaths over there are very tragic. So he was interviewing them, and he, this guy, what, he wrote this letter which they're all supposed to do, the Israeli soldiers, before they go into combat. Not all of them do, but he did. An incredible letter. At the end of the interview, Joel Rosenberg says to these parents, so I'm just going to ask you this question straight out. If you don't want to answer me, you don't have to. But I want to know, are you people people of faith? And it was so sad because the mother, the wife, answered just right back, we are not. We are not people of faith. We are just ordinary Jewish people. And my heart just sunk. And Joel went on and he shared some of the gospel with them and, you know, and said he'd be praying for them. uh, But, wow, wow, you're living there in that land. And so, but they're not alone. They are not alone. So we pray for Israel and the people of Israel just like we pray for all people who don't know Christ. So in this, this first part, I want to ask the question, though, what about the Palestinian people? Right there and all that's happening. There are believers in the Gaza Strip among the Palestinian people. There are many of them. The sad part is, of course, is what Hamas, this terrorist group, is doing there. Uh, And they use them, as we know, if you watch the news, they are using those people for human shields in the hospital. Even even finally, after Netanyahu has been saying their, their headquarters, command centers, are in the hospitals. It's taken a month then for our Pentagon and federal government to come out and say, yes, you're right, it is. And that just shows the the terrorist group, it is the devil working through them, Hamas, Hezbollah. Why? Because the devil hates Israel. 
He hates the Jewish people. That's why he has always tried to destroy them. All the way through the Old Testament, we could go to the book of Esther when Satan was at work through that wicked man Haman to wipe out the Jewish people already then. The birth of Christ. He worked through Herod to kill all the baby boys in Jerusalem, two years old and under, because Satan knew the Messiah was coming through that race of people. So, uh, when we were in Israel, coming on, well, 10 years ago, almost, and we went to Bethlehem, which is part of the West Bank, which is also Palestinian people living there. It's always odd to me, West Bank, I always got to rethink it, why it's called the West Bank, because it's on the east side of Israel, but it's the West Bank of the Jordan River. That's why it's the West Bank, okay? I'll give you some blanks here on this in a minute. But so Bethlehem is part of the West Bank. When we went to Bethlehem, the bus stopped before we got to the border there to go in. And our guide, who was a Messianic Jewish man, we had him for all week, a neat guy, he said, before we go in, well, he said, I cannot go in. It is too dangerous for me to go in there. So there is a, you're going to have a Palestinian tour guide come on your bus who was also a Christian man, and he's going to guide you through there and so on. So just two things. When one, we did a lot of things in there, but one, uh, we went to a large gift shop, and guess what? It was owned by Palestinian Christian believers, and that's why the ministry that we went with, Perry Stone, that's why he stops there, because they are believers. But when we, it was maybe, I'd say from here to the back wall, maybe a little further, from the door getting off the bus to the entrance, going into that shop, it was a little weird, because it was with armed guards and their machine guns standing there, and we were told, you get off that bus, and you go in there, and you do nothing else, you don't go outside, and when you're done, you come back and you get on this bus, period. That's it. When we went to a cafe there and had our lunch that day in Bethlehem, that wasn't the security there, but what struck me most about that was uh, after we ate, and there's always people wanting to sell you stuff, which is fine. So I went to this table, it was just this young teenage boy selling his carved things and all that he had done. And nobody else was there, so I'm just talking with him. He could speak pretty good English. Towards the end of the conversation, he says, would you take me to America with you? That sort of got me right there. I said, you know what, I can't. Please, would you take me to America? And I said, I can't. I, and he knew that too. But those, you, let's think about the Gaza Strip. And, and I, I mean, they need to rut Hamas out of there. They do. It's terrible. Hamas has no regard for the Palestinian people who live there. That, I was looking up the dimensions. You got some blanks there. The Gaza Strip is only 141 square miles. That's it. 25 miles long. Width varies from 3.7 to 7.5 miles. All right, you know how many people live in that stretch? Over 2 million. 2 million. I thought that'd be like going, for, let's say, from Menno to Olivet. Okay, that's the five-mile width. And let's say if we, from there to Yankton, we cram 2 million people in that stretch. And that is where they have to live. Squished. South Dakota, we don't even have a million people in our state yet, which is okay, isn't it? I think so. And we have 77,000 square miles. And that's part of the reason we love it here, isn't it? Yes. 16th largest state in land size. So, but back, back to Hamas. They're backed by Iran. We know this. If you listen to the news at all, you know it. They have no regard for those people in there. Um, they use them as human shields. They set up in their schools, in their hospitals, and it's terrible. And that is how the devil works. Because what is John 10, 10? Jesus said, the thief comes 
to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So how about the West Bank? Just real quick on that. Well, that's bigger. They at least have 2,200 square miles, 2,263, so what, to be exact, and 2.7 million live there. But that's Hezbollah, another group controlled and backed by Iran. And they're lobbing missiles into Israel too, all the time. Because why? Because they do not want Israel to exist. They don't believe they should, and they want them wiped off the planet. And Iran has clearly said that. All right, second point. Why do we stand with Israel was first. Secondly, because God's plans involve Israel. Past, present, and future. Always, God's plans involve Israel. And we know that there's going to be a day coming after, after the rapture, at the end of the tribulation, of the battle of Armageddon, it's called, when all the nations of the world are going to be coming against Israel and the armies, and it's going to look impossible. And naturally it is, but guess who's coming? <laughs> the King of kings and the Lord of lords is coming and wiping them all out just like that to set up his millennial kingdom, which is really what Zechariah 8 gets to. I'm going to get to Zechariah 8 in case you're wondering, okay? So past, present, and future, God deals with Israel in his word. And what about Zechariah? So at the, the setting, the context of Zechariah, he is prophesying to the people of Israel as they have just returned from 70 years of captivity over in Babylon, Seventy years. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, destroys the town, the temple, the walls, just wipes it out and hauls off a bunch of them, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all those guys, back to Babylon, a thousand miles back there, and they're captives there for 70 years. And so they've come back now, and that's what Zechariah is prophesying to them, giving them encouragement, great encouragement. It's a, it's a beautiful time. And, and the words that he's saying, again, are almost too good to be true. All that, the blessings of all of chapter 8. The temple's going to be restored. The walls are going to be rebuilt. Uh, the city will be rebuilt. The people returned to their land. So let's look through four things. These I'll try to go through quickly here. There's many, there's at least 10 times I said when God says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm only going to look at four. What are some of the blessings that God has for Jerusalem and Israel then and coming? Number one, his divine love. He's telling them of his divine love. Verses one and two, Zechariah 8. Again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, Zechariah says. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. I like new living. He says, my love for Mount Zion, and Mount Zion is Israel, is passionate and strong. I am consumed with passion for Jerusalem. He was then, he is today, he was before then, that was his plan for his city, for his name to be there in Jerusalem. His love. Secondly, his divine presence. Look at verse 3. God's divine presence. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. That word dwell means to permanently stay there. I'm staying. My Shekinah glory is going to be there. Look on. Then Jerusalem will be, will be called the city of truth. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain of God. What's so amazing about God saying, I'm going to return to Jerusalem and dwell there. I'm going to abide there. That's where he used to be. 
before they were hauled on and off into bondage, right? The temple was built, the Holy of Holies. We've talked about that thick curtain, that, and let's say this is then the altar where the Ark of the Covenant would have been kept, and the manifest Shekinah presence and glory of God rested there beneath the cherubim. That's the angels. And there it was. And you know, nobody was allowed in there except once a year, the high priest to offer sacrifices. Anybody else in there, you're going to be dead. Well, the bummer is that before they were hauled off into captivity, uh, the prophet, I've got to find my place here again, Ezekiel in chapter 10 prophesied to them God's presence has left the temple. You got all, it's, yeah, the Ark of the Covenant's still there. You guys can go through all your motions of your sacrifices, but I'm having no part of it. You have disobeyed me, you have rebelled, and I'm done. So first was the ten tribes of Israel, the northern. Assyria came, conquered them, hauled them off. hundred years later, the two southern tribes, Judah, Nebuchadnezzar came, destroyed the temple, hauled them off. But God says, I'm coming back. And my presence is going to dwell there. And so he did for a time till they rebelled again. How about when the time of Christ, if we come up to before Jesus was born, was God's presence in the temple at that point before Jesus was born? It was not. It was not. Because they had strayed so far from him again. So here comes the Shekinah glory of God within who? Jesus. Right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Thank you. We beheld His glory. There was the glory of God walking around in the person of Jesus Christ and, and in the nation of Israel as long as He was there. So these verses, I'm try- each one applies to right then when Zechariah was speaking, speaking to him, And each verse is speaking ahead to his millennial kingdom. Millennial reign, which is a thousand years. Okay, let us see. God's divine peace. Verse 4 and 5, listen to this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with cane in hand because of his age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing their peace. God's peace is what that's talking about. Remember, they had been gone in exile for 70 years, and and there was great turmoil, and God's speaking of peace being restored at that time, and it was for a time, and it will be, During this thousand-year reign, which comes after the second coming of Christ, so we're still waiting for that, okay? But i got to show you this one verse in Isaiah chapter 65 where Isaiah is prophesying about this thousand-year reign, what it will be like. Verse 20, he says, Never again will there be in it, in the millennial kingdom, an infant who lives but a few days. Won't that be wonderful? Or an old man who does not live out his years. He dies at a hundred. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. How about that, you 93-year-olds? 92-year-olds? Yeah, got a couple of you in here. You'll be thought a mere youth. By the way, I just got to throw this in. So, you know, Elton had his 93rd birthday recently. Monday, a week ago, wanted me to golf with him. He beat me again. (laughs) He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. This is the millennial kingdom because there will be no war and famine and turmoil. There won't be any of that in that time. Okay, we've got to move on. Letter D, God's divine power. His divine power. Zechariah 8, verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant, so those people coming back from captivity, they're the remnant of this people. In other marvelous what? All that Zechariah is prophesying and all that we think of the millennial kingdom, it does seem marvelous to us today. 
It may seem marvelous. Let me read the New Living. All this may seem impossible to you now, a small and discouraged remnant of God's people, and they were. But do you think this is impossible for me, says the Lord Almighty? No, it's not, because he is the one who is all-powerful. Okay, third point. So what about us? In all of this, we looked at last week, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do today as we are end-time people? We are living in the last of the last days. Does that mean you kids won't live your life out on the earth? We don't know that. You still got to go to school, okay? Still got to go to school. Can't tell your mom, "Uh, Jesus is coming back, so I don't want to go. No, you got to go. Because we don't know when he's coming back. Maybe he'll come when you're at school. That'd be cool. We got to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Always, always, always. Psalm 122 tells us that. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you Jerusalem, be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your palaces. That's what God says. I was so happy to see this last week, Tuesday, the March for Israel at our nation's capital, Tuesday the 14th. Uh, What I've read, the estimates are nearly 300,000 people turned out for that. I tell you, if we would live closer to D.C., I would have sure tried to get there. I didn't know it was happening ahead of time. But praise the Lord for that. We've seen all these other protests happening against Israel. You see it on the college campuses and that, and it's like, really? Do we not remember 70-whatever years ago in World War II and the Holocaust, and we're seeing all this anti-Semitism today? It just... I said it last Sunday. It surprises me. Secondly, we got to stay focused on Israel and Jerusalem. By that, I mean what is happening there, okay? Got to watch Israel. They're involved heavily into the last days, everything. So May 14th of 2018, we were privileged to be alive to see this happen. The United States of America, finally, we moved our embassy from Tel Aviv, Israel, to Jerusalem. What a glorious day. Presidents from, I didn't have time to look up how far back. I'm sure it was back to the bushes and Congress approved this to happen, but nobody had the courage to do it. None of the presidents. It was all approved. No, no, oh no, no, it caused too much tur- turmoil. And, and President Trump said, we're doing it with the help of his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and they did it. It was a glorious day. That was a huge event prophetically to happen again. And Bre- Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, just give me a couple more minutes here, please, okay? I'm trying, I'm trying. He spoke that day. This is what he said of the dedication of this happening. By the way, it was the exact day, 70 years later, of when Israel became a nation in 1948. Wow. He says, Netanyahu, in Jerusalem, Abraham passed the greatest test of faith and the right to be the father of our nation. You know what he did in Jerusalem before Jerusalem was even a city? He took his son, his only one and only son, Isaac, to Mount Moriah. That's where he took him. God told him, I just got to finish this today, okay? If you have to go, you have to go. And if you stay, the Cowboys will win. (laughs) Okay. He took him to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him there. That was Jerusalem before it was ever there. Is that incredible? That is so incredible. And he was going to do it, raised his hand and, you know, hand, and you know the account. God says, no, now I know that you fear me and love me. And there was the ram caught in the thicket to be sacrificed. Netanyahu was referring back to that 4,000 years ago. In Jerusalem, Abraham passed the greatest test of faith uh, on, and the right to be the father of our nation. In Jerusalem, King David established our capital 3,000 years ago. Yes. In Jerusalem, King Solomon built our temple, which stood for many centuries. And we are in Jerusalem, and we are here to stay. And then he quotes from, guess what? Zechariah chapter 8, verse 
3. Benjamin Netanyahu quotes that passage, what I've just been reading to you. Luke 22, I'm wrapping it up. Jesus speaking on the return of Christ, and he says, watch the fig tree. The fig tree is Israel. And that's, he's just getting finished with his discourse, and that's what he says. That's why we stand with Israel. That's why we pray for them, because God's plan involves them. And it is important to do and to know. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, your plans are so incredible. I, it just amazes us. Lord, you're working from Genesis and, and all the way through the ages. Everything in your word lining up absolutely perfectly, Lord. Uh, we have no question, I have no question of the rapture of the church. I have no question of the second coming of Christ in my mind. I know it is. I have no question of the millennial reign or any of that, the new Jerusalem coming down in that place and how glorious it will be. So we pray for Israel, Lord God. Deliver them from these terrorist groups, I pray. And cover them, as Psalm 121 says, Behold, he who, you are the one who never sleeps or slumbers. You are the one who watches over Israel. Thank you for doing that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sitting with me a little longer here this morning. All right. Our closing hymn is Trust and Obey. That's what we have to do as we walk through this world. It's five verses, but we're just going to sing one, two, four, and five. Those verses, okay? Number 571. If you want to stand, please. 571. <laughs> Now may the Lord go with you. May he go ahead of you to guide you, 
behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you his peace. Amen. And we'll sing just one time through, God bless America, as a prayer for our nation. Cheryl for the beautiful music. Remember coffee hour after church if you can help on those soup kitchen spots that would be great too. <laughs>